Welcome to the political jungle, race to the bench. Today, we welcome into the jungle, John Andrew Drew Crompton, judge of the court of the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania and the candidate for one of the two openings on the Commonwealth Court, uh, the Republican nominee. Welcome, Judge Crompton. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to have you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, well, we're, today we're, we're going to hope to introduce you to many of the voters out there who may not know you as well. Um, with uh, COVID, it's been difficult to get out on the campaign trail as, as easily as we have in the past. So hopefully this will uh, give everyone the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. So uh, you were born and raised in Montgomery County, right? I was until I went to college at Dickinson College. I spent uh, uh, most of my formal years, if you will, in Flower Town in Orland in Montgomery County. Great. And uh, uh, you were uh, one, the one boy of three children for your parents? <laughs> yes, I have two older sisters, both who actually are Buckeye fans and live in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, don't count that against me. How did that happen? Um, weird life travels, if you will. One went and a few years later, the other went, but they've both been out there for the last 25 years. So uh, they are... They are happy, content Columbus, Ohio residents. Mm. So they can't even vote for me. Oh my gosh. Well, it's all right. Uh, Maybe yeah. they wouldn't anyway, to tell you the truth, but uh, I would hope I could persuade <laughs> them. How about your parents? Will your parents vote for you? Uh, my father passed away a few years ago. Sorry. Uh, my mother was uh, up until about a decade ago. She lived in Montgomery County still. She has since relocated to Cumberland County, about five miles from my house. And nice. uh, quite frankly, it's been a blessing. She helps go out with the girls and it's nice to have my mom close by, which except in my young days, uh, I've never been used to being any closer than two hours from my parents, but it's really nice to have my mom so close. That's great. Now, are you sandwiched between your two sisters or are you the eldest? No, I'm the youngest. I'm ah. the boy and I'm the youngest. Um, <laughs> But uh, I still tried to make my way, learning from their mistakes. But, uh, now, your dad, what, when he was alive, what did he do for a living? He was a middle ma management, I call him middle management banker in Fidelity Bank. He used to work on Broad Street in Philadelphia. Um, also part of the reason why I began visiting Philadelphia a fair amount, including singing in the Philadelphia Boys Choir when I was uh, a a mere 11 or 12 years old. Uh, so I got a lot of opportunity through that experience, even though it only lasted until my voice changed. <laughs> what What was your, were you um, an alto, a contralto? Or... I was a full-blood soprano. Oh, uh, nice. Sometimes being even a soprano one. So uh, <laughs> yes, I was uh, singing with the birds for a couple years, as I said, got to tour a little bit and uh, Fantastic. had some really great experiences, which was, part with my dad as he was a chaperone sometimes for our events. That's really nice. Can we get a little bit of uh, uh, you know, no chance. Uh, lion sleeps tonight? What do you think? Uh, no chance. No Danny boy, <laughs> no anything else that we used to sing. Uh, I'll do most things during this interview. Sing is not one of them. Okay. <laughs> I like it. I'm saving your viewers, quite frankly. It's because I'm being altruistic. They don't want to hear me. You know, the, in uh, Allegheny County, the Allegheny County Bar had a had a troupe that would do a show every summer. And uh, Justice Todd, Deborah Todd, mm -hmm. has quite a voice. I don't know if he's no, but she sang with the the Civic Light Opera in Western Pennsylvania. I did not know that. Maybe the two of you ought to. I'll, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so you went to uh, the Philmont Christian Academy, right, for school? I did. It was, I uh, went through sixth through 12th grade. It was a very small school. I graduated with 41, 41 others in my class. Uh, I played tennis there, I played basketball, I played soccer, uh, did some other things, even participated in the diary of Anne Frank uh, as, as one of the characters. Um, because quite frankly, when you have a class that's that small, it's you're almost obligated to do everything, even if you're not all that proficient. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience. It was a great little school. It still exists. Uh, it's right on the border of Philadelphia County and Montgomery County. And uh, quite frankly, I have some really fond memories from, from my high school experience there. That's fantastic. Um, I guess, uh, did you do any musicals? 
I, I did not. I, when I was young, I did a few musicals in grade school, but uh, nothing in, in senior high. In fact, uh, Philmont, uh, the other last year during COVID, uh, awarded me uh, Alumni of the Year, which was very nice That's to them. Nice. And um, so it's, it's, I, I wish I got there back, back there more than I do. Uh, but it's, as I said, it was a great learning experience and it, and it was formidable in a lot of ways. Now your, uh, your daughters, you have two daughters, Mallory and Morgan, and, uh, uh, did they go to parochial school? Did they go to public school? Private they, school? they, ever since first grade for both of them, Mallory enters the ninth grade this year, Morgan enters the fourth grade. They are both at Cumberland Valley school district in public school and have been since, uh, as I said, since first grade. And quite frankly, we've found the experience to be excellent. Teachers have been excellent. The school district um, is, is really fantastic. And even though there's sometimes a push and a pull between public and private schools and Catholic schools as people go through and families decide, uh, so far, at least to date, we've always been pleased with, very pleased with the experience. And at least as of now, plan on keeping them there until they graduate. So uh, after, after high school, uh, you went to Dickinson College. Um, how did you arrive at Dickinson? What, what drew you there? I'm not sure. I mean, I was a confused senior like many young people are. Uh, I was looking for a school that was relatively small because of my experience with high school being so small. Uh, 2,000 students at Dickinson seemed like a dramatic, dramatically large, even though it's one of the smallest private schools uh, liberal arts schools in the state. Yeah. Um, I just found the experience great. I mean, in the sense of when I was trying to look at colleges, I applied early acceptance into Dickinson. I got it. And that pretty much ended my pursuit of where I would go to school. Uh, so it's, it was relatively painless, even though the uh, acceptance letter came the day before Christmas. And my mother did say, well, this is really going to ruin Christmas if you're not accepted. Uh, it all worked out. She denies saying it, but mm -hmm. uh, it was a it was a very good experience. And quite frankly, even though I a bit stumbled upon it, Dickinson was an excellent fit for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask you, but uh, about your mom. Did your mom work when you were growing up? Uh, she did. She worked part time. She was a lab tech. Uh, she went to Bucknell and University of Penn. She's extremely bright, uh, brighter than her son, uh, but. Uh, uh, she worked part time while my dad worked full time. She really did. Her her whole purpose of working was to help with the tuition of of that for my education as well as my sister's. It's mm. wonderful. Uh, so where this law thing come from? This law bug. When did you decide that you wanted to go to law school? You went on to Widener Law School. Was it during college before? It's a good question. Once again, it was searching for something that I thought would have answers when I was in sophomore and junior year of college. Um, I, I was fairly committed to getting an advanced degree. Uh, I wasn't necessarily hell-bent all my life on being a lawyer, uh, certainly also not being a judge, but the point was uh, it seemed like a good idea and something that I could use and, and wasn't quite sure how I would use a law degree, uh, but as I pursued law schools, I started to warm up to the idea. Uh, and so you went to Widener Law School and uh, now Penn State. Uh, did you have something to do with the, uh, the change to Penn State from Widener when you were in the legislature? No, I think you're confusing Dickinson College's oh. brand with Penn State. That's right. Um, un the, undergrad, the undergrad Dickinson stayed independent and the law school uh, went with Penn State. Um, it's a good question, one that I'm not sure I've ever gotten before. Uh, there was a lot of consternation, as you might know, on Dickinson Law School's affiliation with Penn State. It went for years. Uh, I remember a couple of press conferences in Carlisle, uh, represented by senators who I worked with, uh, who were very concerned about what that meant for the parochialness of Carlisle, um, eventually it worked out. And I think mm -hmm. everybody thinks it was, maybe not everybody, most people today, I think, think it was a very good affiliation for both uh, Dickinson Law and for Penn State. 
Uh, so that's kind of one of those examples where there was a lot of strife. And I think looking back, people think that it was probably a, a decent move. Although I will say it, there are those who graduated from Dickinson Law School who uh, still are not pleased with the affiliation. Right, right. I, uh, so after law school, did you go straight into to the legislature? Or did you work in a firm? What was your uh, first job after, after law I school? I did. I worked for a small firm in Harrisburg uh, while I was a student at Widener. Um, in the end, it just didn't work out to stay with that firm. I started to, excuse me, I started to scramble a little bit in my second semester of my third year of law school. Uh, talked to some people, talked to some friends of my parents, and got a, offered a position in the policy office of the state Senate. I wasn't quite sure what that meant or all of my responsibilities, but I was happy to have a job uh, with some decent benefits. And even though the salary in today's standards was not, uh, not high, uh, it was, I was thankful to be employed at a law school. It was kind of a tough market. Um, thinking that I would do this for a couple years and then move on to a firm and start my real legal career. But, uh, but you stuck around. You, uh, <laughs> you <laughs> but worked your way as up. man-made plans often go, mm -hmm. uh, 26 years later, I decided to leave the state Senate. I did serve in lots of different capacities, which we can talk about. But uh, yes, I was there for, for the majority and the almost exclusively barring my service now as a judge in the state Senate in the Capitol. But you also uh, maybe can help. One of the purposes of our show is to help uh, folks who are considering a career in politics or uh, to understand the different paths that they can take to, to get there. Um, and you worked as a, a policy person, but you also were a lawyer. Uh, did you do sort of legal lawyering functions or why don't you explain that to, to our viewers? It's a good question. I did lawyering functions under the rubric, if you will, of the General Assembly. Uh, early in my career, it had nothing to do with trying cases. It didn't have anything with representing clients, private clients, uh, but it had everything to do with looking at the law, uh, analyzing how to make statutory changes to the law, looking at the Constitution, uh, and making judgment calls as it relates for the individual senators on how to proceed on a policy issue or a bill or an act. Uh, so it was grassroots, if you will, in the law, but it wasn't what most people think lawyers do uh, as representing uh, ordinary citizens as clients. You found yourself appearing before, the, before in the courts of, of the Commonwealth even as a staff. I did, but that was that was later in my career in the last 10 or 15 years of my career. Once I moved out of the policy office to the president pro tem's office where really I spent 25 years, uh, that was a different capacity. That was a capacity where uh, I also had some leadership responsibilities to the staff of the Senate. Uh, but a lot of my work, uh, over the years drifted away from some of the statutory drafting that I did early in my career and probably for a decade where I principally was responsible for working on bills, writing legislation, uh, working with the governor's office, working with the house, working with agencies to develop pieces of ma major pieces of legislation. As my la uh, the last second part of my career, I worked into more of a leadership function where I managed people to do those functions, but also had a principal responsibility for handling a lot of the litigation that comes both civil and criminal through the legislative process. Uh, so yes, on lots of different issues, we were uh, frequently appearing before the Commonwealth Court and also uh, before the Supreme Court and occasionally also in federal court, where although we often had outside lawyers to manage some of the day-to-day -day litigation, my responsibility, the best I could describe it, is as the quarterback of that litigation. 
I approve the briefs. Sometimes I drafted certain documents. I work with lawyers who are in the Senate and also outside the Senate uh, because, you know, there's no secret. Most of those cases were relatively high profile. And so when you're suing the NCAA, NCAA when you're um, suing the governor, when you're responding to a suit from the governor or working on a whole host of other high profile, including congressional redistricting on several occasions, you need a team. And um, I don't think people on my team would object to my characterization as I was the quarterback of that litigation, even though there was a lot of helpful hands incorporated in lifting those big cases. Um, you know, I, we have this part of the show we call show and tell. And uh, we asked you to bring something and we kind of surprised you on that. I, I, what I want to ask you about, because I, my producer, uh, John Dominguez, told me you might have a chiclet story and uh -huh. chiclets, uh, uh, Ambler, I don't think people realize, but chiclets were born in Pennsylvania. Um, and Louis Mall was 101, just died, I think, in the past year was the inventor of chiclets. But uh, so anyway, in his honor, is there a chiclet story? Well, there, there's a question on who who truly invented uh, chiclets. And Louis, Louis Maley, Maley uh, thank you. is the way you pronounce that name, happens to be my grandfather. Oh. Um, my mother's father who died, mm, it's probably about close to 10 years ago now, uh, was a graduate of Penn. He fancied himself as an inventor. Uh, he has some wonderful sketchings of documents of machinery that he got uh, approved by DC on patents. Uh, in fact, we've even had researchers from some Smithsonian's on whether or not we would release some of those original sketchings that he did on patents. Um, yes, he's my grandfather. Yes, he invented chiclets. And I tell everyone that who is skeptical um, there's a wonderful bio uh, about him when he passed away in the Enquirer, um, at least giving some substantial truth to the fact that he did do that. Uh, and I also tell people, how does one make it up that your grandfather <laughs> invented chicken? Um, he spent his whole career, which I think is interesting, working in the bubblegum industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also caution people, caution people that there is no chiclet fortune. Uh, he sold the idea very early in his career, uh, and he was apt to say that he thought it would be cool to have gum and candy at the same time. And the gum comes from the chicle tree. So he put all those things together and produced a chiclet, which is not all that uh, readily available in the United States anymore. Mm -hmm. But I will say for those who still long for a chiclet, uh, Mexico, for some reason, sells an immense amount of chiclets even to okay. this day. So uh, don't the build the wall too high. high. What's that? <laughs> I said, don't build the wall too high. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a federal issue. Um, but uh, <laughs> As far as the chiclet issue, uh, it's still uh, very well received in Mexico and some other countries on that's the great. issue of where you could get them. But yes, that is my chicle. That's my chiclet story. Um, I, I, it, it is truthful, uh, although it is. I will, I will agree. It's a little hard to believe. Yeah. Well, I, I love it. I, I, it's great. I didn't know it when I asked you, and so it's a great story. Thanks for sharing that. I want to do quickly uh, run through what we call deep dive and just ask you real quick questions about who inspires you, what gets you up in the morning, what keeps you up at night, and what you want to be when you grow up. Um, as far as inspiration, who's your inspiration? Who is your role model? I've had several, and I think uh, sometimes people just pick one person, and I've tried to learn life lessons from a lot of people um, because, you know, someone can be incredibly influential and still make some mistakes. Um, and Steve McNett was one of my predecessors in the Senate. A lot of people won't know who that is. He was a bit of a legend in the Senate. Uh, and certainly the, for the first 15 years or so in the Senate, it taught me an immense amount about not just the General Assembly, but about state government and all sorts of other things professionally. 
look, my mom is an inspiration to me. She's 84 years old. We're going to take a trip in a couple of weeks. Um, there's no summer trip that doesn't include her. And so she is mobile. She is bright. She is an uh, incredible grandmother to my kids. And so she makes the list as well. Um, but there's lots of people that, that some people, quite frankly, that I've never even met. Uh, I just find some, uh, especially now in my new capacity as judges, judges that I have observed that I have tried to take life lessons from. Um, but those are, those are a sample. But I, I think yeah. uh, if we're all honest with ourselves, we probably have lots of people that we look to over life's long curve that we draw life lessons from. And they impact us even 20, 30, 40 years later. How about uh, motivation? What, what gets you up in the morning? What are the things you love to do? I mean, I, I, and I'm talking about fun stuff uh, like uh, you're a Philly sports fan. I'm sure true and true. Yeah. Spend I time am. with Habitat and Humanity. Uh, Go ahead. Well, I, 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 think, I think the base answer to your question is I've always enjoyed problem solving uh, in lots of different capacities, professionally, personally. Uh, I, I enjoy something that's difficult to manage. I enjoy looking at it from as many sides as I can get my brain to wrap around. Um, and I think that's part of the enjoyment that I had in the state center was to take often the most difficult problems, sometimes difficult personalities as well, and try to create a path forward on either solving the problem or improving the law, or in some cases winning the litigation that we were pursuing. And so problem solving isn't just a professional issue. It's also uh, an issue dealing with others and, you know, be it the HOA problem of the day or some other issue that are, uh, impacts us on personal level. Uh, I enjoy walking through especially difficult ones and trying to come out on the other side. Uh, look, I do enjoy Philly sports. Um, I've said that I'm a lifelong Comcast uh, user because they publicize, they, 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 they have all the Philly sports. Um, but uh, look, one of the things that gets me up in the morning is to have the time with my girls and my wife. And um, look, I, everybody looks on COVID as this curse. Uh, it was incredibly meaningful in our family to have that much family time. Look, I can't promise you that every hour was perfect, but the point is it was, and as we look back on the stay home and the things we did as a family, even traveling to remote places to just be the four of us was incredibly worthwhile and probably will never be given that opportunity again yeah. because of our fast moving lives. But mm -hmm. um, I look back at COVID and, and quite frankly, don't see all bad. I see the positive lights of what it meant to have to have formidable years with your daughters when they are nine and 14 and basically tell them they can't leave the house. Now, look, I don't want to duplicate that effort. I don't want this to ever occur again. But, you know, it's the it's the type of person I am to look back at those moments and go, you know, there was some really positive things that came out of that time with your family. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you 100 percent. Let me, uh, I'm going to jump to rapid response because I want to have a little bit of fun with you so you can, uh, sure. you shouldn't be spared. This is the part of the show where we uh, just play a little bit game. It's easy. You choose one or the other rapid response. Yep. We're going to call it the Crompton's Encyclopedia edition of rapid uh -oh. response. Um, all right, here we go. Crompton's right. or Britannica? Uh, Britannica. Okay. Simon Crompton or Claire Crompton? Do you know who either of those people are? Mm, no, should I? Probably not, but maybe, I mean, you have the chiclets thing going, but Simon is uh, the editor of Permanent Style. He is the, the, the style guy of the UK. And so you might want to look him up. And then Claire oh, wow. Crompton, known for knitting and crochet, also in the UK. So you have some very, you know, interesting namesakes. Well, that's where, that's where if you lead our DNA, it comes from that region. So I'm not claiming credit for either of them or as an offspring, but that is the region, <laughs> a little bit of Germany, but also a little bit of that area as well. Great. 
How about Silver Spring Township uh, in uh, Cumberland County or Silver Spring Montgomery County, but in Maryland? Maryland. Uh, I'll take Silver Spring, Cumberland County any day. I, I've been to Silver Spring. I've been to uh, the Maryland part. Uh, the traffic is different. The noise levels are different. The bustling is different. We have plenty of good opportunities here. I'll stay where I am. Excellent. How about Baccio Italian Cucina in Erdenheim or uh, Silver Spring oh. Diner? I've been there in Erdenheim. That's an excellent pick. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure it's worth the two hour commute, but I'll pick <laughs> that place. I've been to the diner. It's a perfectly decent diner, uh, but uh, it would give me the opportunity to literally be a stone's throw away from my high school. And maybe I could hit a tennis ball on the, on the courts uh, at Philmont. So it seems like we could package that very nicely down there. I like it. How about uh, Charles Giro or Dr. Cornelius Van Til? Uh, the latter being the Philmont founder, the founder of your Philmont Academy, and Charles Giroux, one of your very, very uh, yes, illustrious uh, I take the founder. I, I have respect for Charlie Giroux. Uh, I like his dedication to the school. Uh, I have not met another person in Cumberland County or this region that graduated from Philmont other than Charlie Giroux. Uh, but I'm taking the founder because uh, for for Charlie's good attributes, he didn't find he didn't found my high school. Which named you alumni of the year this year. Yes, so, and I don't right. know if Charlie had anything to do with that either. So yes, yeah. that's another strike against Jarrell. All right, here's a harder one. Bob Jubilier or Renee Cohn Jubilier? Uh, that's that's an excellent question. Uh, if I can't take them both, I will take Renee only because she's an excellent colleague of mine on the court and I deal with her more often than I deal with Bob Jubilier, although I saw him a few months ago and it was good to catch up with him. Uh, I have a lot of respect for both of them, but if you put a gun to my head, I will pick Renee because uh, there's only nine of us on the court. So we're <laughs> close, we're closely aligned and uh, I pick Renee. All right, Swan songs, Lynn Swan or Harold Carmichael? Uh, Lynn Swan. I look, I, I, I know that might surprise you. I spent uh, only because I know I should say Harold Carmichael, but my answer is Lynn Swan. I spent uh, six months with Lynn Swan almost every day during the campaign. We spent four months riding around the Commonwealth in a bus that was uh, papered to be his image and slogans. Uh, we went to every county fair just about across the Commonwealth. And I tell people that that bus, although really cool on the first day you're there, uh, it gets smaller every day. So after four months, that bus was the size of a, a <laughs> less than a car or low, or at least it's so seemed. But I have an incredible amount of respect for Lynn. I enjoyed every day I sent, spent with him. I don't think I've ever met Harold Carmichael. So Lynn Swan wins. That's great. Well, it helps you with the, your, uh, your votes out in the western part of the state. So. Good choice, Judge. Really appreciate having you uh, having you on in the political jungle. Best of luck on the campaign trail, and uh, come back. Look, it's been really fun. Um, some of the campaign is often dry, and I look forward to these uh, opportunities, even if it's via Zoom, to have some nice interaction and and do something that's different than the day to day trail. So I appreciate your time very much. You're very welcome. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time on the political jungle.